today we have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Emily Goodman Scott. And Dr. Goodman Scott is an associate professor and school counseling coordinator at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, uh, Virginia. So welcome. And we're so happy to have you. And um, is there anything else you would like to add about yourself? Well, greetings. I'm so glad to be here. Um, hello from Virginia, from the East Coast of the United States. And I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled. I'm, I'm glad to be here. And thanks for that warm introduction. So I am, I'm a, I'm a faculty member at ODU and um, I'm in year eight here. And um, I love being able to, uh, to train the next generation of school counselors. And um, in addition to that, I get to do a lot of, of work with um, school districts and organizations. And um, a piece of why I went into my job is as a previous, I was before this, I was a practicing school counselor and a special education teacher. And um, I came here as a way to help advocate for the profession. And um, I spent the last 10 years on the board for the Virginia School Counselor Association. I was chair of the board this past year, um, wrapped that up this past summer. And I'm currently president of the Association for Child and Adolescent Counseling, which is an ACA division, which includes mental health counseling and school counseling. So um, it's great to be here and um, getting to work with folks all over the country and internationally as well, such as yourself. So um, thanks for having me. Thank you. So today we are going to be talking about um, your article, which is titled Ramp and PBIS. Um, they definitely support one another. Um, this is a topic that I'm really excited about. We've begun discussions in our district about ramp, the ramp process and PBIS. So these are topics that are very near and dear to us and hearing about how those two can work together synergistically is, is an awesome opportunity. So let's jump in and let's start with just kind of the basics. So this is about RAMP, which is um, the ASCA program. And this is also about PBIS. But starting with just kind of the basic, can you like give us kind of a general um, definition? Absolutely, I can do that. Um, I wonder what I'd like to do is open with a bit of a story that I think will, will unfold these, these pieces, right? We have RAMP, we have PBIS, we have all these acronyms that can turn into alphabet soup so quickly, right? <laughs> Um, so to, to kind of start at the beginning, um, for myself, several years ago, mid 2000s, I was a practicing school counselor, I had the, the honor of opening a brand new elementary school. So I was the first full time school counselor and the only full time school counselor for several years. And um, I just finished my master's program, I had learned all about the ASCA model. And as we know, with the ASCA model, it is um, by many as, um, as what they strive for in terms of implementing a comprehensive school counseling program. So different states may have different models, but in, in general, um, we have the, the overarching ASCA model, which embodies comprehensive programming. So we have direct services to students, indirect services, we're using data-driven decisions, um, evidence-based practices throughout, but it's really a framework, just like a math teacher has um, standards that they have to meet we have standards and we have a model that we that we follow. And it's it's been so funny. My first principal said, Emily, um, folks are so busy. School counselors are so busy advocating for everyone else. They don't advocate for themselves. So I think a big piece of this is acknowledging that and we have extensive training and data and how to be leaders in our schools. So RAMP is really a way of measuring that and um, looking at are we implementing all aspects of a comprehensive program? So. Um, back to my story, when I was a practicing school counselor, my principal called me um, a couple months before the school year started, and she said, I would love for you to attend this PBIS training. We're getting more and more schools up on PBIS um, to implement in the district. We would like you to go to the training. It's a two-day training, um, and we're going to have a, someone from every, every grade that will be there. So there's a team of about eight, eight folks. And I'd like you to be the PBIS coach to really be in charge of these efforts. And me being the good school counselor and being excited to start a new job and wanting to be a little bit of a pleaser, which I think we can do sometimes more than we should. Um, I said, sure, I'd love to. I can't wait to make the training. I'll be in charge of it. Absolutely. And um, as soon as I hung up with my principal, I, um, I hung up and then I immediately did a Google search and said, what is PBIS? 
Um, because in this time period, in the mid 2000s, we, we had a lot of, and we continue to have a lot of awareness around PBIS in education literature. So then we had a lot of conversations in, in education generally, but in terms of school counseling, there was nothing in our journals and our conferences and our presentations and the webinars and podcasts. We weren't talking about it. I'd learned nothing about it in my master's program. And I, I graduated from Virginia Tech. It was a great and still is a great program, but we didn't talk about it because we just hadn't had that conversation yet. So I went to this, this couple day training. And um, as I started to learn, what is it, what is um, PBIS? And I learned it was an overall framework. And with the framework, we, we want students to, um, to be, um, we want to increase school safety, um, student outcomes such as achievement, better attendance, better school climate, et cetera. We want to increase these things. We want to be culturally aware, culturally responsive. Um, we want to use a systems lens. We want to use data to drive our decisions. Those are the things I learned about PBIS. And that got me thinking, well, this is what we're supposed to be doing as part of implementing this PBIS. We look at the whole school, have its common language, common expectations, use data to determine who are the students that have elevated needs, what are, what are the problems that we need to make systems change to, and then make those changes. And um, so that's what it means um, to implement PBIS. And I thought, well, don't we have the same goals as practicing school counselors, right? We want to use data to determine um, where are there gaps in our school? How can we change our school as a system? What students need more support? Um, we want to be culturally sustaining. We want to have, again, the systems approach. We want to have a school that has better achievement, better attendance, better school safety, decreased problem behavior. So these are all the things we want to do. Don't we have the same goals? Both of these frameworks, comprehensive programming, the Ask a Model ramp um, and PPIS, we really have these same goals. So why are we not talking about that? So I started to, to think about that. And at one point that next school year, I was busy starting starting the school, a school year and this brand new school and, and starting this program. But um, I remember at one point I had this very vivid memory. I sat down at my desk and I pulled out the Ask a Model. I looked at here, are all the recommended school counseling activities and then I looked at um, PBIS. And as you know, if you know anything about PBIS, you've seen that triangle, right? The three tiers. What do we do for all students? Tier one, some students tier two, and then students with the highest needs, the tier three level. So I made a triangle. I, I uh, drew it on a piece of paper and I wrote down um, school counseling roles. And I said, well, what is school counselors? What do we do for all? Um, such as classroom lessons for all, um, these initiatives, we're doing school initiatives, school um, like kindness initiatives or looking at data for the whole school. Where are our gaps? What do we need to work on? So what are we doing for all? What do we do for some? Counseling, individual counseling, consulting with um, teachers and families about specific student needs. And then for, for few, for some with the highest needs, we're, we're on um, committees that are looking at how are we providing wraparound services for students? What extra supports do they need? We're looking at data. Do they need, um, do students need to be evaluated? Um, are they in the best setting, et cetera? So all these pieces we're doing already as school counselors, but why don't we have this conversation about looking at it in terms of the three tiers? Because a part of this work, and this came up in the study a good bit, and um, it was such a privilege to do this, is that we had these ideas. And um, my first, so I was a school counselor for several years, I became a counselor educator really as a way to advocate um, and continue this conversation. And um, I was able to meet a couple different folks, Dr. Jen Betters Bouvon from Wisconsin, Dr. Peg Donahue from Connecticut, and more recently, Dr. Jake Olson from California. So the four of us and, and some other folks, we've been working together for the last several years. Um, our group really started about seven years ago and um, we call ourselves School Counselors for MTSS. It's really just a collective of, of school counseling faculty, previous yeah. school counselors that really saw the magic, if you will, between aligning PBIS and school counseling. Now we, we give an overarching term of NTSS, which includes the academic RTI and the behavioral PBIS. But um, so we've been, we, we do work together. So we published our first article in 2016 about what does this mean to align, to look at PBIS um, and those three tiers. And a big piece again is advocacy. If we know that um, everyone in our school community, our administrators, our, um, our stakeholders, the people making decisions on budgets. Do we give more money to school counseling or do we give more money to that, to having an extra reading specialist? They're having to make those decisions. So if everyone else is using the, the language of multi-tiered systems, the three tiers, data-driven, 
we need to use the same language. We know um, our goal is to implement a comprehensive program, um, ask a model, looking at ramp. But when I interviewed for my school counseling position and I, I said to my principal, I want to implement an ASCA program. I want to go up for ramp. And she said, what? What is ASCA? What is ramp? I don't know what that is. And in a way, I had to do some code switching or some, some brokering between the school counseling culture and the school counseling world and the administrative world. And, and this alignment between school counseling and MTSS really helps us get there because we're speaking the language the rest of our stakeholders are speaking. If they're using these language and aware of these concepts, instead of talking about just classroom lessons, how can we say, well, this is a tier one support. Um, we're doing these classroom lessons. So again, we're using the support. We're making sure we're at the table. We have an entire school leadership team. We know that we're school advocates, that we make systems change, but we need to make sure we're sitting in the room and we're at the table where these conversations are happening. So your MTSS team, you're, they're looking at data to drive their school's decisions to make their annual um, school improvement plan, to look at where are the gaps and how can we change things? We have to be at the table. But again, if we're, if we're um, and we're talking about running an ask a model program, but we have to kind of translate that so folks understand how this fits in the context. So we're able to then better educate on the ASCA model and advocate for our role, but we're just using the lens that folks are, are already, already speaking. So my colleagues and I have been doing this work um, for, for several years and um, it's been great um, social media um, presentations. I mean, we're, we're talking all over the country and we've had two books that have come out in the last year, year and a half or so, um, a school counselor's guide to MTSS and um, which we have folks from, from all over the country who um, are experts in PBIS and school counseling. And we also more recently had, including George Sagai, who is really one of the, the founding figures in, in PBIS, um, wrote our first chapter of that book and his colleagues. And then more recently, Alaska, we published Making MTSS Work in the last six weeks or so. And um, that has examples from all over the country of exemplary model schools school counselors and districts that are, are implementing PBIS with really strong school counseling programs. And how does this look? So it's really just pages of examples. So um, other, other schools, other school counselors can, can look at what does it look like when it's working? So I, I use all of this as, as kind of the preface to say, this is our interest, um, myself working with colleagues, um, shout out to them because they've been such a big part of, of my work, but we've done really what guides our, our work is research. So we, we developed this model of what does it look like to align school counseling, ask a model, including ramp with, um, with PBIS. That was one of our first articles is this, this idea piece. And then we've done more research to try to test it. So one of my um, studies I did with one of my colleagues, Dr. Tim Grothaus was the one we're talking about today. So it was amazing. It was such a dream to do this. So as I mentioned, um, getting into this role, getting to train the next generation of school counselors, work with school counselors from all over. Um, a piece of that is using research. And um, who, you know, go figure, I was a little intimidated when I started the faculty role about research. Um, but I've come to love it because I do a lot of qualitative research where I interview. I get to interview practicing school counselors, school per personnel, and I get to hear their experience. And it's an honor to hear their stories and then to be able to showcase their stories and their experiences to others as a way to advocate. So doing this study was such a dream. It was wonderful. So I was able to look at where are, um, where are schools that have ramp in the last several years and where are schools that have a high degree of PBIS implementation, as we say, implementing PBIS with fidelity. So I was able to look, okay, here's a list of ramp schools. Here are also schools that are implementing high degrees or, or, or very successful PBIS and where's the crossover. And they were willing to sit down and have a conversation with myself and my colleague, Dr. Tim Grothaus. And um, we published two articles. This is the first one of the two, but it was amazing. So being able to hear when you're doing both things really well, um, school counseling, obviously with RAMP and PBIS. So um, out of all of the things that they said, what stuck out is probably the strongest theme is I'm probably strongest two things. When I said, tell me about this, PBIS, school counseling, tell me about this. You're doing both these things well at your school. And the first thing they said, they just sang praises is they said, these two fit together. All of the different participants that said, there's this marriage between them. It's this union between them. They go together. They just saw all these quotes about how well they're aligned and they fit together. 
So that was really, really neat. They said, it's just this perfect union. They're both data-driven. They both have similar goals. Just like I said earlier, we want to promote a positive school culture, positive student outcomes, be culturally responsive, et cetera. We, they both have the same goals. So to implement them both, instead of you know, being in our, our silos, we want them to be together and working together because we're more efficient and more effective. It's like better together, right? So that was one thing they talked about that a lot, which was so exciting to hear because that's what I had envisioned in a perfect world. When, when I made that model, when I, I sat in my, my school counseling office and sketched that on a piece of paper, I said, I wonder if these could go together. So it was really validating to have research to back that up, to say, yes, this is happening and this is how. Um, so seeing that alignment um, was the first really, really strong theme. The, the second really strong theme in this research was data. The school counselors, they could not talk enough and be excited enough about the use of data. So Dr. Hudson, let me tell you, they were just thrilled. They said having two data-driven frameworks in the school, being able to integrate those, it made PBIS stronger because we're using our school counseling data in the PBIS team and we're using the PBIS data in our school counseling program. So a lot of times school counselors say they struggle with outcome data right? Um, to show, you know, to gather it, to assess it, move that needle to show how they're impacting that. Because as we know, student outcomes like reducing discipline referrals, um, it's not just the school counselor that contributes, it's really a whole host of us. So we're one of many individuals. So really, if we're trying to assess just our role on just that outcome, it's really, that's, that's tough. But if we're part of a team, okay, we, we see that we have these discipline referrals, what's the root cause here? We're going to talk about this as members of our leadership team. School counselors are going to do this. Teachers are going to do this. Administrators will do this other thing. And we're going to work together. And again, it takes this, gets us out of our silos. And we're going to all look at the data together. So we don't have the pressure of gathering it and assessing it ourselves, which we can do. But why? If we can be efficient and effective with our time, why not partner with other people that are already pulling the outcome data and already talking about it and already making goals Let's just hook into that and be part of the team that's already doing that. And the most recent version of the ASCA model, when they have um, this summary, this data summary, and they look at who, the first couple of questions, who is collecting data in the school and um, what are the goals? So instead of reinventing the wheel of school counselors, let's look at what's already happening. So it's really, if we wanna advocate for our roles, it's, it's making sure that we're being efficient and effective and um, not reinventing. So I could talk about this on and on, Dr. Hudson, because I feel so excited about this, but these are the two kind of the biggest themes. So I'll kind of maybe, maybe pause there and, and see what questions you have for me. Well, I know that was just a lot. It was like 15 minutes of talking. Very yeah, excited about that. Awesome. Um, I want to go back to what you were talking about um, as far as like working in our silos and trying to break out of that. And um, one of the things that I was reading in the article and it, um, a comment that one of the participants said was, you know, it's hard to, to let go of some of those responsibilities and turn the reins over to someone else. And I feel like um, just reiterating, I guess what you were saying that PBIS really is like a key to unlock that door to be oh, I able love to that. that that gap for us to say, you know, we are a part of the larger community. We are a part of the culture and it's okay. It's okay to work with others. And it gives us that common language so that I'm not over here, you know, talking about ask a model and people are like, what does ask even mean? Mm -hmm. You know, like we're speaking the same language. So we're able to convey what we are doing and add validity to what we are doing in a language that they can understand and jump on board with, you know? So it's there, it provides the vehicle for us to be able to connect and make it a part of our culture to embed it. Because we're, like you said, we're speaking the same language and um, it's so much easier to see that it really, we really do have the same goals. Like we're trying mm -hmm. to meet the same goals. So here's the language that helps us both understand each other. Completely. So it really does help us speak the same language. Um, and so it's, we're almost like a translator. We're interpreting um, school counseling talk to education because throughout all of our history as school counselors, we have these 
these dual identities? Are we counselors? Are we educators? My thought is we're both, but that means we're doing a lot of translating for the counseling world. Translating, here's how it applies to education. Mm -hmm. And for the education world, we're saying, here are the unique skills and expertise we bring about counseling, how that looks now in education. So we really straddle the line. We have a foot in both worlds, which is great because that means we also have to spend a lot of time advocating and educating our stakeholders, both in the counseling world and in the education world. Yeah. And I know like uh, as a counselor, when I was in on the um, school level and in schools, but even on this level, I talk to counselors a lot about the fact that uh, so many times we just do, like we just do because we know that it needs to get done or, or we know in our mind what the ESCA model is and what we're trying to accomplish. And I feel like PB PBIS and MTSS really allows us um, or gives us the voice that we are searching for so often to say, this is what we do. Like we aren't just running around being busy. These, these are the things that we do. And this is how it fits into the, the, larger, um, the larger picture. And uh, mm -hmm. the data piece is something um, I think that we do struggle with as school counselors. Um, a lot of what we do is qualitative, I think, mm -hmm. by nature. but this allows us to quantify a good portion of that qualitative data, which is important. That's, you know, how, that's the nature of the beast. That's how we show what we're doing and how we mm -hmm. are making an impact in our schools. So it helps us tremendously, I think, in that area to be able to say, you know, this is how we're making a difference data-wise. This is how you yes. can see it. So um, it does. It makes sure we're at the table with where the decisions are being made, where the data is being discussed. Absolutely. Because so often we know they are, we are putting out crises and fires constantly. Look at this this time that we're in with COVID. It's a very unique time. We're seeing the rise of mental health needs. And that's not going to go away when the pandemic. I mean, we're, we're talking about vaccines right now, right? Because it's December. And um, gosh, I looked at the paper this morning and we talk about, you know, it, we're just starting to roll out vaccines, but we know even when we get back and we have a little more, I'm using air quotes, business as usual, it's still, we're going to see the impacts of this pandemic for years mm -hmm. um, and to get fully back. So I think knowing that we have a lot of, of needs and a lot of roles, it's very, very easy to be reactive. I remember as a school counselor, I'd have my list of things to do for the day. And some days I'd look and be like, oh, I did literally nothing on my list because yeah. um, things come up, right? We're really busy and it's like a blessing and a curse. It's, it's an honor to be able to be there. And it's also tough because we also have things we need to do. It's like my principal said, we're going to advocate for our students and we're going to do the things we have to do for our families and our staff. But at the end of the day, if we don't advocate for ourselves, when it comes time to make those tough budget decisions, if folks don't know what we do then, you know, if we're not in the building because, or we have too many students, we're not going to be able to take care of our students. So we have to, this is a way to take care of ourselves, um, this advocacy and, and making sure we're at the table. And um, as you mentioned this, we're so busy doing, you know, all these other activities or these other roles. Um, it's very easy for that to happen. There's a great um, article that came out by um, Dr. Anita Young, and it's called From Doer to Leader. And it's on the Ask a site that came out in the last year or so, probably late 2019. But if there's a way to share that with folks, it is fantastic. I love it. It's, it's a, it was in the app, but it's a really nice read. And I, I talk about that a lot. And I, when I do presentations for districts or organizations, I'll often send that out in advance because it talks a lot. Do you want to be a doer? And it's like an assessment. Are you a doer? You're reactively responding. And we know part of our job is we have to do that. Or how can we change some of those things from responding so right. much from being a doer to then being a leader or being more purposeful? Yes. And it's hard because it takes a lot of energy at the beginning, just like PBIS, just like comprehensive programming. Um, like it takes a lot of time at the beginning yeah. to really lay that foundation, but then it saves you time at the end. And I, I've had so many quotes of, of school staff saying PBIS takes so much time at the beginning, but it's worth take a year or two just to really start to see that you're going to have a lot of struggles and a lot of work at the beginning but keep the end in mind um, with both comprehensive programming it takes five years to fully get a comprehensive program up and running and several years for, for PBIS mm -hmm. so you know it's so important to have patience because the, there's a lot happening and, and as we see these mental health crises I mean it's, we're going to need to be responsive 
but putting that extra time at the beginning um, to lay the groundwork. So knowing, so normalizing that it's a normal, it will take more time at first, but you're going to see the benefits. I agree. And, and that's one of the things that um, I try to convey when I talk about um, building a comprehensive school counseling program. When um, I, I'm originally from South Carolina mm-hmm. and um, I, I was a doer, I was a, a doer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I filled in where things were needed and I felt like I was proactive, but I wasn't proactive in advocating for myself, for the role of a school counselor and what we did. And I remember about, um, I'd say about three months after I got a job with Dode and was living overseas, I got an email from uh, the secretary and she said, the principal just walked in my office and said, all this time, it was Lakeisha doing all of these things and now she's gone, you know? (laughs) And I was like, that really made me think though. It's like, I I don't want it to be like that. Yes, I'm glad that I made an impact in that school, but I want there to be an awareness of what I do and and how I can be a leader and how I am a leader from within my comprehensive school counseling program. So, um, and I think sometimes that is hard for school counselors to, you know, toot their own horn, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, and say, you know, this is my program. This is what I'm trying to do. This is how it benefits our students. This is a part of the holistic education of our students. Um, And I think, again, merging these two really helps with that process a lot. It really does. And I've been reading some research recently about school counseling leadership and how do school counselors perceive themselves as leaders. And what's been really fascinating is, that example I gave for myself, my principal calls the summer before and says, do you want to do this? I have no idea what it is. Not only do I want to be on the team, do I want to be in charge of the team? I've never heard of it, but I want to be a good helper. And I say, sure, I'd love to. I want to please my principal. Um, And I think we see a lot of counseling and that's what this research is showing us is when you look at types of leadership, we see a lot of school counselors, just like my example, that we may be more comfortable in this aspect of leadership that is collaborating and supporting and teaming. We want to be a good team member, we want to be a good collaborator. But what we're seeing is those school counselors that are having a high degree of this collaboration, they want to pitch in and help wherever, we're seeing a low level with those same counselors of being systems change agents and advocating and and being comfortable pushing. Because as I've been thinking about a lot recently, when you're advocating, that means you're, you're challenging the status quo and that's not sunshine and rainbows. Right. Um, you can get pushback because your system is, is happening in a certain way. There's this homeostasis to the way things are. So if you're going to question and change that, and we have to do that because that's how we use our voices to, to advocate for our, our students in our school. Yes. But if, um, if we're maintaining the status quo, I mean, it's more comfortable, I think, often to, to be this good collaborator and this almost nice counselor syndrome. I've, been there. I, I mean, that's how I entered my, my job. So I totally get that. And um, so for me, that's been eye-opening to see that what the literature says is a high degree of, of wanting to be a helper and a collaborator can be a lower degree of this um, advocacy, pushing the system, changing the system a bit. So, um, and I see that all the time when we, when we look at incoming grad students and mm-hmm. they say, I've always wanted to be a school counselor. I want to help. I want to make a difference. And um, I think we can be so focused on that because that's true. That's what we want to do. But advocating and changing the system to make it more equitable, that makes a difference too. But there can be more pushback in the process. So that's probably a conversation for another day in terms of advocacy. But it's been really interesting that multiple studies have have shown that, um, that theme. Well, and I think especially in a school environment, um, Mm -hmm. when we only embody or heavily embody the helping portion, you wake up and you are drowning under other duties as a sign. Yes. So um, advocacy is very important. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Advocating for ourselves so we can do the job to help the students. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, One thing that I found uh, interesting or one of the many things I found interesting in the article um, is when you started uh, describing some of the challenges um, that um, counselors saw with, you know, implementing the PBIS pro- uh, process and the um, RAMP program. And um, 
it talked about the first challenge was um, the large time commitment, like we've talked about, required to start um, like the PBIS implementation um, and the ramp, you know, all of the things that you have to do to start those. And then mm -hmm. it talked about um, second um, in regard to ramp and PBIS involvement, the school counselors mentioned the importance of delegation, which we've talked about. Um, as well as their hesitancy to do so. Um, and then sometimes counselors, um, and I'm quoting here, sometimes as counselors, we need to remind ourselves that we don't need to own or run every program that, com that connects strongly to our role. Um, that is how we easily become overwhelmed. Um, and Again, this goes back to what we were saying as far as PBIS being able to be that key that opens the door. So we're not in a silo and we don't feel like we have to um, own everything and do everything that strongly connects to school counseling. Because I think a part of it, I know for me, um, just thinking about it, it was that they don't completely understand, you know, what I'm doing, or they don't understand the ASCA model, or you know, all or school counseling standards, all of those types of things. But as you said, PBIS puts it in a language that they can understand, mm -hmm. and so it is okay to turn some of those things, uh, uh, you know, over because there is the understanding that we're all working towards the same goals and and seeing how it all meshes. Um, but I do think that is something that is a challenge or a struggle for school counselors feeling like it's just easier if I just do it myself. If I do it myself, then I know I'm going to hit, you know, my goals and my standards. But um, helping the counselor and helping other stakeholders see how it's actually not two separate things, <laughs> like, um, really makes a difference there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think you know, it's so where it's a challenge looking at, and I, I find this myself is there's so much that we want to do and we can do. You often hear school counselors are the heart of the school. Mm -hmm. And if, if I was in a room, if we were all here together and I said, raise your hand, if, if you're leading multiple committees, perhaps it's the school's hospitality committee or the SCA, or you're, you're overseeing the food drive and all these pieces, we're going to have all these hands. How many different programs are we running um, to help the school out, Right. Mm -hmm. And um, that's part of us, why we got into this job is we wanted to make a difference and help. And there are many different ways to help. And it's hard to say no to those things because it's very easy to become overwhelmed and want to do these things and say, okay, I can do it myself. I can get this done. And um, it's funny how that did come up. And I see that with myself. Just yesterday, I was asked to do something and um, I really wanted to say, yes, that was my first thought is I want to say, yes, this will be great. But I, I've been trying to be very careful with when I get a new request to pause. So I paused for a few hours and I came back and um, I and one of my my colleagues, Dr. Jen betters Buban, has um, a quote that she uses and it's on her desk and it says, how does this lead to the life that I want to create? Mm. So I thought to myself, and life is more than just work. We have to realize that life is work and everything else. Like, like our job is one, if, if our life is a pizza pie, like our, um, our work is one slice, but it's not the whole or even the half of it. Yeah. So we have to be mindful of that. So how does this lead to the life that I want to create? And I thought to myself, well, I could take this on. I could do this, this extra task, but realistically, um, I'm stretched really thin right now. It's, it's COVID. I have little ones at home and the mom to three little ones who are doing a lot of their schooling at home right now. Um, we're in the middle of moving. We have different things happening personally, professionally. I've taken on a new administrative role this year and um, I'm president of a national association. I thought all these pieces, I would like to say yes, but how does this contribute to the life that I want to live? And if I, if I take on this, that's going to mean all these other things I'm doing, it's going to take away a little bit from those things. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, I'm going to say no, and I'm going to give them a referral to someone else who I knew who is excellent, who would do a great job. And I did. So I thought about it. So that's what I'm trying to teach myself is um, when I get something, it's really easy to respond and say, yes, yes, I'll do it. But how to pause it for a few hours, think about it. How does this contribute to um, the life that I want to live? Or, you know, how are we looking? Um, really, how does this fit with my goals? And not just, well, I have time. I could do this for 30 minutes tomorrow. But does this fit? Because I could do something else with that.
there as well. And I probably have a million other things I could do with that 30 minute time block tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So um, not being caught up as much as we can help it with those bright, shiny new opportunities that come along. How does that fit with what you're already doing? So you can really be careful with your energy and your, your time and, and take care of your, yourself. So mm -hmm. I think we can, we can often want to do everything, but if we do everything, it can also lead to burnout and that we're not doing all yeah. of the things as well as we would want to. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, when schools and districts are looking at um, implementing both like RAMP and PBIS, it actually gives pieces of that pizza pie back. Mm -hmm. because you are sharing the load. Oh, completely. So if we have that, that pizza pie, right? Instead of it's, here's me running a comprehensive program. Another piece is me being on a leadership team. Here's another piece is collaboration. You're like, nope, that's actually the same piece. Mm -hmm. Like we can run a comprehensive program and um, be involved with PBIS and all these, and collaboration, all these things are actually the same, but we have to get out of our silos um, right. in order to do that. So if we want to look at, at using data to guide our school counseling program, but we're having that conversation during the PPIS meeting where we're also working with other people. And we have our advisory committee for our school counseling program. We have members of the PPIS and the school leadership team are on our committee. I mean, it's, it's really how can we be efficient and, and have these things really be woven together rather than separate? Yes, definitely. So if you, if, we are a fledgling district, fledgling schools trying to get really both of these programs or types of programs off the ground. Um, what's some advice that you would give? I think one is, um, is taking a hard look at the, the support that, um, that you have. As we know with PPIS, you really need to have 80% buy-in mm -hmm. and especially administrative support. This is something that cannot be done with a party of five people. Um, or even or yourself or a small group, it needs you to have buy-in because the school-wide, it's changing the climate and culture of your school mm -hmm. and systems change takes a long time. I talked with a school counselor a few years ago. It took her years of, of just chipping away and saying, oh, look at the school who's implementing it and look at their data and this is how they're doing it. It took her years of chipping away. And several years later, um, I would see her at our state conference. She would say, guess what? Our administrators are finally on board to fully like look at this and we're starting to implement and it took her years so this does not happen systems change does not happen overnight um oftentimes we want to be like little speed boats and zip, zip, zip right. around make those quick changes but our schools and our districts are more like these big like tankers that they, they want to make a change they got a plan for like hours of demands to make that left hand turn right so realizing that that's the system we're working in and it takes time to get by it not to be discouraged um, but it, it does take time for both of these. And same with implementing a comprehensive program. I remember thinking, we used to call it the, the, the audit, the, the school counseling audit, about what are all the pieces you have in your program. And I said, as a brand new school counselor, I'm going to take this audit every nine weeks. I'm going to make sure I, I have all the pieces in place. Well, no, I did that once that year. And then I didn't get to it again. Um, it takes five years to get all these pieces in place. You don't start the first nine weeks in a brand new school that, that just opened, um, let alone a, a brand new position entering into a position. So it takes time. I think being patient with ourselves and breaking things into small manageable pieces is a big help. I agree. And I think even from the district level, um, I've learned to celebrate, even if I'm celebrating by myself, mm -hmm. um, just the small differences that I see, the small changes um, and realize that it is a marathon. It is not a sprint. Um, mm -hmm. But to, as you said, just keep chipping away at it. Um, school counseling is something, you know, it is a passion of mine. It is a chosen profession. And so um, I want to see us like, you know, keep reaching the next level. Um, so that um, that's great advice just to remember to not get discouraged and to just keep chipping away at it. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. This has been a great talk. And it's full of great information and um, some ideas about ways forward. And, and that's kind of what we're looking for um, as we um, embark upon this journey. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. 
My pleasure. And if, if folks would like to connect, I'm, I'm active on social media professionally, be able to share resources. And if anyone's on Twitter, E underscore Goodman Scott, look for me. I'd love to connect on Twitter um, in terms of, of MTSS in particular, school counselors for MTSS, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, we, we are able to connect with folks really throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, sharing our, our love for MTSS, sharing resources. It's been a fun way to connect. So um, please keep in touch. I'd love to connect with you. And thank you so much. It was great to be here, Dr. Hudson. Thank you.